Good morning, everybody. I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's Spotlight webinar on the Capital COVID-19 Snapshot Return to Work Survey. This webinar is made possible by the Maryland Department of Transportation's Commuter Choice Maryland program. My name is Gladys Hurwitz. I am the Multimodal Transportation Specialist at the Maryland Department of Transportation and moderator for this session. This session is being recorded. I just want to go over some quick FAQs to keep in mind. You should have chosen either a computer or phone, phone audio for your audio preference. Please use the questions window to ask us a question. We also have time dedicated at the end of the presentation for some questions and answers. And this recording will be available at our website at commuterchoicemaryland.com. We will be using uh, Poll Everywhere to get your feedback throughout this session. Please either join by web at pollev.com and enter the code MDOT253 to participate. Or you can also participate by text by texting MDOT253 to 22333. Then you'll be able to text in your responses. I'll give you all a second to get that set up on your end. Okay, great. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with Commuter Choice Maryland, it is a transportation demand management program of the Maryland Department of Transportation that promotes alternatives to driving alone. As you can see from our list of alternative options, this can include anything from public transportation, biking, ride sharing, transit, walking, and teleworking. All of these options are important because they help Maryland reduce congestion, conserve energy, protect the environment, and improve the quality of life of all Marylanders. Commuter Choice Maryland has been around for over a decade and underwent a program update in 2018. During these past two years, we have refined the program focus, offerings outreach, and continue to build partnerships. Commuter Choice Maryland also provides resources for commuters to help them determine the best commute option that suits their needs. Our website serves as a centralized resource for commuters who may need information on transportation options, along with other valuable resources, such as how to connect with a Maryland rideshare TDM rep, information on guaranteed ride home, and how to find the best commute that works for you. Employer program services include information on how to get a commuter benefits program started or how to expand an existing commuter program. We do have free marketing materials available for download to help your employees with commute options. And we also provide free technical assistance to participating employers who need help with commuter benefits such as the Maryland Commuter Tax Credit and transportation fringe benefits. We worked with the University of Maryland, Maryland Transportation Institute, to develop a commuter calculator that can help commuters who may be driving into work by themselves every day and are open to considering a new commute with benefit estimates for choosing an alternative commute. By inputting information such as your start and end locations, preferred departure time, number of days you commute, and vehicle information, the calculator will help determine how much money you can save on gas vehicle maintenance costs, parking cost savings, and environmental benefits for various commute options. Business toolkits have also been developed to help businesses and organizations in Maryland who are thinking about starting up a telework program, Vanpool, or a commuter benefits program. Especially during this pandemic, Maryland businesses shared that many of them were interested in offering commuter benefits such as telework but didn't know where to start. So we developed this resource tool that includes information on the benefits of telework, what to include in a telework policy, a sample telework agreement, technology considerations, and other additional resources. We continue to look for more businesses and organizations to highlight for best transportation practices in our newsletters and websites. Past businesses that we have highlighted include the University of Maryland, 
Yakabad, Live Casino and Hotel, Smeko Ayopa, and Morgan State University. If you would like to be highlighted or would like to make a recommendation, please contact us. When you want to hear about your transportation success story and encourage participation from organizations and businesses of all sizes. We also offer webinars on a regular quarterly basis. Many of our webinars have touched on various transportation topics, such as commuter benefits, business tax credits, and reflections of remote work during COVID-19, lessons learned from Maryland businesses, to name a few. All of our past webinars are available on our website for viewing. Please make sure to sign up to stay connected and up to date on future webinars. So I'd like to go ahead and get started on a poll. Our first poll asks, does your workplace currently have a return to work site plan in place? So you can respond by going to pollev.com and type in the code MDOT253 or text MDOT253 to 22333. So go ahead and and put in your responses. Perhaps many of you <clears throat> have, have nothing in place yet or you're not sure if anything is currently being planned. Or perhaps your workplace is currently in the planning phase. Or your, your workplace is ahead of the curve and you have a plan ready to be implemented. So it looks like for those of you who are able to participate, it looks like about half of you currently have are in the planning phase which is great and um, some of you uh, it just dropped from about half to a little under half um, oh e even dropping even lower uh, currently um, are, to your knowledge do not know about any planning taking place okay that's interesting to know so i'm going to go ahead and close that poll and we do have one more poll lined up for you all go ahead and cue that up how often do you estimate teleworking post-pandemic? Do you think that you'll be teleworking some of the time, maybe one to two times a week? Maybe for some of you, it'll be most of the time, three to four days a week. Maybe you anticipate continuing to work full-time uh, teleworking, um, five or more days a week. Or for some of you, maybe teleworking wasn't an option during a pandemic, and you actually had to go into the workplace um, in person. For those of you who may be answering other, feel free to go ahead and enter your response in your chat box, and I'll make sure to uh, share some of your other responses. But right now, it looks like the popular option is certainly at least some of the time, right? At least one to two days a week which is great. Okay. Thank you for your participation. I'm going to go ahead and close this poll. Okay, so for today, we have our guest speakers, Mariceli Di Gravio, Manager of Research and Insights, and John Hillegas, Associate of Transportation Policy with the Greater Washington Partnership, who will share their findings and provide insight to the COVID-19 snapshot return to work survey. Thank you both for joining us today. Um, please feel free to take it away. Wonderful, thank you so much, Gladys. Um, and I am going to try to share my screen here as well. Um, I Thank you again for uh, inviting us to participate. Um, hopefully you all can see my screen now. Um, my name is John Hillegas. I'm uh, from the Greater Washington Partnership um, and my colleague Mariselli um, will be presenting today on the Capital COVID snapshot. So for those of you who are not familiar with the Greater Washington Partnership, we are a civic alliance of CEOs and entrepreneurs from the capital region, um, which we define as from, from Baltimore to Richmond, including Washington, DC. And uh, we uh, have three primary areas of focus, and those include transportation, talent, and inclusive growth. So I am part of the uh, transportation team here at the partnership. The, the capital COVID snapshot, um, the idea for this came around this summer, 
uh, and it was really uh, built around all of the uncertainty around the pandemic. Nobody really knew how long this was going to last. Nobody really knew how others were responding and, and planning to respond. Um, you know, we were all kind of thrown into this situation in March of, uh, for those who were fortunate enough to be able to work from home and be able to transition to that. Um, we kind of uh, went into it in March and then summer came around and we still didn't have a clear end in sight. And so we created the Capital COVID Snapshot um, in the first iteration of it we did this summer to try to close the gap in information and, and share more information, um, both with employers and with transit agencies uh, from around the region. And, and one of the big impetuses for this was we kept hearing from our board members and our, our employers um, that they were really concerned about their employees using transit and they were concerned uh, uh, that um, they would uh, that the transit systems would be crowded and it would it would spread to, um, spread the virus and so we wanted to try to provide as much information as possible about the state of the transit system but also the state of how people were planning around the uh, coronavirus so that um, people could make the the best decisions that work for themselves um, for their families for their companies um, and on our board we have we have companies that range from um, healthcare providers like MedStar and Innova or, or Johns Hopkins Hospital. Um, and a lot of their employees have really been on the front lines of the pandemic and haven't been able to, to work from home. Um, and then we have, we have other uh, employers like um, T. Rowe Price, Ernst & Young, Northrop Grumman, who a lot of their employees have had the opportunity to work from home. Um, and so we, we wanted to um, kind of pulse the region to, to get a better understanding of, of what was happening. Um, so before Maricelli shares the results of the second iteration of the survey, um, I'm going to share two tools that you can find on our website, um, which is at the greaterwashingtonpartnership.com slash capital dash COVID dash snapshot, where you can find a lot of uh, insights about the survey results, um, but also two tools that we developed um, to try to improve information about the state of the transit system. So the first is what we call the transit tracker, um, which hopefully you can see here um, on my screen in front of me. And we developed this um, with one of our board members, Ernst & Young EY, um, as well as with WMATA and transit agencies from around the region. And what we were trying to do was just um, provide information about how crowded the system was um, at different times of the day. So you'll, when you come here, I mean, I encourage everyone to kind of play around with it because there's um, a lot of great features. Um, but the first tab of this transit tracker is just an overall look at the WMATA Metro Rail System map. And what I'll just say here is kind of the key finding from throughout the pandemic is that on the Metro Rail System, there has been a lot of extra capacity. Um, and uh, that is in terms of even with the social distancing requirement. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you'll kind of see how we determine the, the threshold numbers for occupancy, um, but you can toggle between the pre-COVID capacity and the current capacity with social distancing, where we define as anything more than 15 people on a metro rail car is considered some crowding, and anything more than 23 people on a metro rail car is considered crowded, um, which before the pandemic, you know, you might be able to fit 90 people on a, on a rail car before it uh, got considered crowded. Um, but the key takeaway here is that by and large, um, there has been uh, no general crowding issues on the metro rail system. Um, so you can even come and, and pick a specific uh, time of day, a specific day of the week, um, and, and see and look at this kind of at a glance. And you can see it's all green right here, um, meaning that uh, the, the system by and large is not crowded. Um, we also broke down this information so you can look at it um, by uh, station. Um, so for example, um, I can click on a station here, uh, if I click Union Station, um, and I can see over the course of the day, what is the busiest time on that, that system. And you can also um, change the, the timing here. So if I wanna see the last few weeks, um, the, the data will update and will show you what the average crowding was. Um, so you can see by and large, even at Union Station, which I live in Baltimore, I used to commute um, into DC, and I remember the morning commutes of jam-packed red line cars. Um, um, but you can see that by and large that the, there, there's excess capacity on the Metro Rail system. Um, and then you can also uh, look at this on a, on a 
per line basis and see a, a general snapshot of kind of the system as a whole over the course of the day. And so, you know, we don't want to tell people what to do, but we want to provide them the information so they can make the best and most informed decisions about how they move about the region. So there's a lot of great um, WMATA Metrorail data here. And uh, after uh, we released the transit tracker, WMATA also started publishing this information for their bus routes, which we were really excited about. So, so now you can, you can tell um, uh, whether a bus is crowded or not, and you kind of make a, a decision for yourself. Um, for non-WMATA agencies, um, we, we asked them to provide summaries of what policies they put in place to protect their riders and their operators, um, and how their levels of service compare today uh, as compared to before the coronavirus. So this is just a summary table of, of all of that information that you can kind of check out for yourself, whether the, the transit agency you use or you used to use, whether um, you know, masks are available, whether they're requiring masks, whether they're still collecting fares or doing rear door boarding. Um, again, I'm, I'm kind of flying through this, but I encourage you to check out all this information for yourself. This tab shows VRE trains um, and specifically the, the exact amount of riders they had on VRE trains. Um, so you can understand whether or not you know, the train you used to take is crowded and, and if you do have to go back to the office, whether that is a, an option for you. Uh, and then finally, um, because we do span from Baltimore to, to Richmond, we also have the, the Greater Richmond Transit Company on here. Um, so you can see the, the bus ridership um, uh, data and the average passengers per bus rider. And I think this just kind of speaks to the, um, the, the state of the transit system, kind of the, the dual transit systems and the, the differing stories in the region during the coronavirus, where we've seen that WMATA Metro Rail, which is typically used by commuters um, or heavily used by commuters going to offices has not had um, capacity issues. Uh, what, whereas buses, while they may not um, be exceeding uh, crowding uh, limits, um, there is more ridership and they have sustained more ridership throughout the pandemic. And I think it just underscores how essential bus service is for the region and, and how as we move into budgeting, uh, budgeting processes for the coming fiscal years for transit agencies, we really need to make sure that we're preserving bus service so we can um, make sure that people who need and rely on the bus are, are as safe as possible as we, as we uh, uh, continue to, to vaccinate everyone. Um, so that's a transit tracker. Um, and then just the one other thing is the back to work barometer here, which I, I find interesting. And we worked with Castle Systems who they provide a lot of those key fobs and different apps that you can use um, to access your work site. And they broke down their, their data by our three metropolitan statistical areas, so DC, Richmond, and Baltimore, to give the high level trend of what is the pace of return to work sites. Um, now this is only applies to uh, Castle clients and um, they tend to skew more towards office work sites. Um, but you can see here just the this really steep dramatic drop um, in late March and that we really are not even not even um, close to uh, pre-pandemic levels. Um, so again, please check out um, these for yourself, but I, I hope you found the, the kind of presentation interesting. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my co colleague, Maricelli, who is gonna uh, dive into the actual survey results. Um, if I can figure out how to stop sharing. Hi everyone, um, this is Maricelli de Gravio. Thank you so much, John. I always find that the uh, secondary data on transit really complements and gives context to the survey. Um, I'm actually gonna turn my camera off so I can make um, the screen a little bit bigger for you guys and for myself. And then I will sure turn it back on um, when we go to Q&A. So I have about seven minutes um, to go over these results. I wanna make sure that I cover everything. Um, as John mentioned, um, we first did the survey last year around August. That was the first iteration of the survey. So this is really a sort of follow-up to uh, the second survey, uh, what we call the second survey for the capital, for the capital uh, COVID. Um, just to give you guys an idea on the methodology, obviously we're not doing anything that is experimental in design. We're just taking a snapshot in time of employers in the region. Um, we um, relied heavily on our partners, uh, public trans transportation agencies and their, and their mailing lists. There were in total 24 organizations that helped us distribute the survey. We really wanted a good representation of employers in the region. We reached out to um, any size 
of work sites located in the capital region. Again, we define the capital region as Washington, Baltimore, and Richmond metro areas. Um, and respondents, we really want to make sure that we were including the right people in the survey. We wanted people that were C-suite level leaders um, and other decision makers, directors of planning, facilities that are involved in reopening plans and activities. Um, it would be lovely to hear from employer from employees, but that's another survey. We really just wanted to focus on the employer side. Um, data collection for this iteration of the survey um, happened between November 11th and December 11th. I mean, we're talking about very close to the holidays. Um, cases, COVID cases were going up. So there's a lot of really interesting external factors that um, might have contributed to some of these results. And we're gonna talk a little bit about it too. Um, EY was responsible for hosting the survey and managing the process on, online. They did a, a fantastic job. And overall, as I said, this is not meant to be a census of all employers, but it's just meant to give us an idea uh, direction on the results of where our region is in terms of um, reopening and plans for the future post-COVID. Total, we had 172 employers responding to the survey, which together represent about 140,000 employers, people employed in our region. So a pretty good representation. Gladys, if you can move to the next slide, please. Um, hoping to get the polls and the sentiment of employers. Um, the main and I think most important question that everybody's probably asking is what is, you know, what's going to happen next? When is my office going to open? That is, if you are still working from home, as John mentioned, a lot of our employers, um, employees were essential, so they really never got to experience working from home. And we asked the question from employees, uh, from employers, you know, which of the following things, and we gave them a list, um, is the biggest driver for organization decisions regarding, regarding bringing your employees back? Um, interesting enough, I mean, it, there was no surprises here. The COVID vaccine is really what's driving it in terms of employers feeling safe and, and giving the, the same feeling to their employees. Um, another really, really um, interesting trend in the survey is the focus on employee sentiment and the personal health concerns. Um, employers are quite concerned um, of their personal situations and that how that may affect their return. I mean, there's obvi obviously some people that might be immunocompromised or still have kids in the house, um, you know, from schools being closed, as you see, that's number four, it's still also very important. So if you really look at this, six out of 10 respondents think that COVID-19 vaccine is driving it, but there's a really, really good number of employers who are very in tune with what's going on um, socially as well, with employee sentiment, schools still being closed, and of course the state and local mandates that do not give much of an option. Um, next slide, please. The other question we had is um, the feeling of safety, right? What are some of the solutions out there that could really help you become resilient to this type of situation in the future? So if we have another pandemic, what do these employers think are the best solutions, you know, to avoid that something that like this happen or they're a little bit more resilient? Um, rapid testing was a quite popular um, answer. Um, talking about those rapid testing with very immediate results um, in, in the office space. Improved ventilation and sensors that measure the concentration of the virus in the air. So really making modifications in the office space to ensure that, um, to ensure that it, it's a safe environment. Um, PPE is, as expected, a popular answer, but it was kind of interesting to see how ventilation came above PPE, which kind of shows to me that these employers are very well educated and how the virus and how these things can spread quickly. Um, and then we have other, other responses that are around the pre-entry wellness checks, uh, touchless solutions, and the contact uh, tracing systems. Next slide, please. One of the questions, and, and I think that this is a bit correlated with the uh, employee sentiment and the employee personal health concerns. Um, very, uh, this was very telling. Um, we asked employers um, when we think about how COVID may have disrupted their services and impacted interactions in their workplace. We asked them which which of the following are the most concerning to them, and we asked them to really kind of focus on the three top uh, things that are very concerning to them. Um, maintaining organizational culture, employee mental health, loss of collaboration, all these things made the top of the list. 
much, much higher than loss of revenue, loss of, of customers, and you know other things as employee retention. So it's really, really interesting how the virus has exploded um, and, and really impacted um, the organizational cultures. And I mean, I, I jokingly, I talked to my friends that they are so they're so brave to start a new job last year. You know, it's a whole different environment on how do you how do you understand the, the very subtle things that you, know, you you sometimes you can only understand when you're in an office or face to face with somebody, particularly dealing with organizational culture and employers are very much in tune with that. Next slide, please. This was a, a, a kind of follow-up question from the first survey. Um, we wanted to know when did they expect um, their employers to be, to, their employee, their workforce to be back in the office. And we just took all the responses from employers and averaged it. And basically now they're expecting that about 30% of the workforce would be back in the work site. Um, by fall 2021, they're saying that way more than a half, about 76% of their workforce is going to be back in the office. Now, the change that we saw is almost like this timeline got pushed. Um, I believe that when we asked this question last time, most people assumed that half of them would be back by now. And we're seeing definitely employers um, taking their time and holding back uh, and waiting to see what happens with the vaccine to bring everyone back. Next slide, please. The other question we had was, um, there's a lot of talk out there. If you look a lot of the McKinsey and um, uh, conference board work, they're talking about how employers are thinking about diminishing their footprint office, are offices closing? Are we all work, gonna work from home? We actually asked that question. Um, and this is interesting because most of our respondents are smaller employees. Um, it, they kind of reflect how our, our employer base is in our region and 75% reported that they have no plans to increase or decrease workspace real estate. Again, this was a sort of short term in the next 12 months. Um, and the interesting thing is when we asked those the same question from uh, larger employers with more than a thousand people, 30% said that they are at least looking into like reducing work sites and workspace. So this might be a reality and a trend for larger employers, but when you look at, you know, most employers are just kind of like in a wait and see situation as well. Next slide, please. So this is a, a very interesting question and it mirrors your poll. Uh, love to see how it really mirrors your poll. So that makes, that makes a researcher, a poller very happy, is that we asked employers, um, how, what are the, what are their expectations were like currently how many people are actually their pattern of working from home and in the future you see the red here what do you think that is going to be the organization you know what the organization they anticipate the behavior will be and again if right now you have very few people teleworking some of the time in the future that is going to be the biggest trend Full time, most likely not. So we're really looking into a trend of going back to the office. Uh, most people, the most employers, do not anticipate that their um, workforce will be teleworking from um, full time. So this is interesting. Right now, about 60% of employers say that they are. Future, 1%. Next slide, please. Um, Public transit, that's a big one. And that's was kind of like the, the inspiration for our survey. And I am moving very fast here because I think we have two minutes. So what we see here is um, a very interesting view of asking first. And I want you guys to kind of focus on this slide here. But passengers, we asked them whether they would be um, confident that their, their agencies would be able to uh, ensure that passengers were wearing masks. The, 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 the sanitary conditions of the systems and then limiting crowding. When we asked last time, there was much less confidence than this time. So what we're seeing is a change, a directional change of perception, a little bit more positive in terms of being able to take pub public transit and feel safe. Now I am going to skip the last slide. You all can find the presentation online and the, next, the last one is just a, a fun one to know. I want to be very conscious of time here. Um, Mar Mar and Tali, it's, okay, it's okay if you if you want to go through the next slide. You know, okay. folks. Okay, are you sure yeah. we will have time yeah. for Q and A? 
Perfect. Absolutely. Okay. I have the recording for folks who want to watch it at a later time because we stay on for some Q&A still. I think it's really important to cover that. So Perfect. So that's, okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the fun slide, right? Um, we were, we, we had, John and I had had conversations with many folks out there, uh, many thinkers out there who are doing a tremendous job trying to prove how safe um, transportation is. I mean, like, if you if you open the United website now, you're gonna see the first on the very first page. You see that they're doing ton of research to prove that it's safer to be uh, in a plane in terms of COVID transmission than anywhere else. And in, in comparing to different, those are actually very researchy type tests that were done with ventilation systems and so on. So we really wanted to know. We know that employee sentiment um, and perception really drives uh, what's going on with transportation right now in terms of usage. We really wanted to see where employers were, were, what were they sort of capturing from their workforce. So we asked them, you know, rank the following venues that you see here. So you see grocery store, office, indoor arena, public transit, gym, and in terms of perceived risk of COVID transmission. So one here would be the most, you know, so if you see anything that's a little bit lower score, this is the one, this is the the, the most concerning venues versus grocery store that would be a little bit higher score. And this, those are actually the least concerning venues. So if you look at this, what we're seeing is public transit is kind of like up there. It's still very much, uh, uh, there is a perception out there that you, know, you can easily get um, COVID, not easily, but like it's a lot riskier. Um, and then if you look at office and grocery stores, those actually ranked a lot lower. So uh, there is a story here, I think, for, for public transit agencies and, and places where we're educating co consumers and, and customers that it is safe and continue to do so because it's a perception that's going to drive a lot of what you saw at the data that John presented earlier. So that's it for us, folks. This entire report is um, available online. This is just our methodology. You can go into the industry type, organization size, and how many work sites were represented in the survey. And um, all this information is in the website. Um, you can play with um, the work barometer, the, the transit tracker, and we're hoping to do the survey again later this year, or maybe we'll, not, we'll need to if we have about 72% of the workforce back by fall. And I think that John and I can, yes? Open yes. To Thanks so much, Maricely and John. That was very insightful. Yeah, let's go ahead and take some questions. Some folks actually sent some in ahead of time. You you had touched a little bit about telework um, at least through 2021. Can you provide any additional insight? Do you feel comfortable doing that uh, for te what telework would look like through to 2022? Somebody had a question about that. I can I can um, try to take that, Marcelli. Um, you know, I think. Uh, one thing that our survey shows is that there's still a lot of uncertainty around what the future holds and what the ideal state is in terms of uh, teleworking. Uh, I have found it, um, funny is not the right word, but you know, before the pandemic, uh, lots of um, transportation, uh, uh, people in the transportation industry have been trying to convince employers that you, know, you should allow your employees some telework flexibility um, and then we all kind of started teleworking on the drop of a hat, and 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 now the focus is uh, is on well, how do we bring people back to the back to the office? Um, and I think there's going there needs to be, and there's going to be some really interesting conversations over the next year about what that ideal balance is between teleworking and 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 working in the office. Um, and keep a lookout because the the partnership um, will be coming out with a report. Uh, fairly soon um, with our partners at EY on what would it mean if if teleworking continues um, at the elevated levels that we've seen um, or or even close to the levels we've seen over the past year? What would that mean for the regional economy? What would that mean for um, the transportation system? What would that mean in terms of in terms of equity? Because we know that the people who are teleworking tend to be um, uh, uh, have better educations and, and have higher incomes and and there's been you know industries that have been built up around our office work sites and our, our central business districts and and if we start to shift away from that uh, what will that mean for employment what will that mean for um equity in our region um so that should be coming out uh, in the next few weeks so keep an eye out for that report 
Um, but it's going to be really interesting. And I think a lot of you probably saw that Salesforce uh, announced, I think, yesterday that um, moving forward, you know, their employees are going to be able to choose whether they want to telework or, or come to the office. Um, and and <clears throat> unfortunately, Maricelli and I don't know. We, our, our crystal ball has been cloudy lately, but um, the, the survey does the survey does show that a lot of people think some sort of telework uh, is here to stay, but the exact amount is still un, undetermined. Thank you. So what, what have you guys heard from employers, if anything, regarding um, their their feedback, you know, that you may have received regarding the survey uh, report? And do they do they say that they need additional tools to help them plan for that return to work? Was there any insight regarding that? Uh, that's a great question. Um, and <clears throat> our, our, the employers on our board, which is who we um, kind of interact with the most, you know, they range from everything from employers located in, in downtown DC or downtown Baltimore and, and those located in Anne Arundel or Prince George's County. And kind of the needs of these different employers are very different um, depending on, on, on their circumstances. Um, for, for those who their employees tended to drive to work before the pandemic, they're probably going to continue to drive to work after. Um, but I think one thing that a lot of um, our employers have, have talked to us about or we've heard, heard from other people is uh, just more information about what, what are the options for preserving some of the work and, and quality of life, work-life balance benefits that we have experienced from the pandemic, but also um, avoiding some of the, the worst outcomes, the loss of collaboration, the, the potential impacts to, to small businesses if we, if we all continue to telework. And um, I'm, I'm, we're really glad to be part of this conversation, but it definitely there's a, still a lot more to, to figure out of, of what we want the future to, of work to look like um, in the region and, and nationally. Okay, great. And here's a more technical question. Somebody asked, do you know what percentage of your employer list who participated with the survey were federal agencies versus private employers by any chance? Do you have like a rough estimate? Um, we do, we do under methodology. So there were more private employers. Um, I would say if the, I, I think you might be on mute, Maricelli. I can't believe I'm still learning this after a year. Um, so okay. I was on mute. <laughs> I was on Thank you, John. Um, so uh, as far as the, the breakdown, we did not, we, we, we kind of combined um, all the um, government, government agencies. We didn't, we didn't go as far because 172, most of our companies, most of our employers were either the big ones or the smaller private ones. Um, we had, if I can't remember on top of my head, but it was less than 20%. Um, but you can find you can pretty much either email me if you're really interested in the in the results. But there were very interesting um, trends with the federal um, federal and government agencies. They were more likely, and again, because of the sample size, I don't want to make a big splash about it, and we didn't publish. But there was a very interesting um, direction for the results. Federal employers um, were more likely to actually say that they would allow more fellow work. Um, which to me was like, huh, maybe this is, you know, maybe this is, they will be the, the everybody's going to follow them in the future, you know, maybe they'll set the tone, you know, like, I don't know, I've always, I've always worked for uh, private organizations who, who waited for OPM before they said that we could come into work or not on a snow day. So maybe, you know, the federal government's going to help out there. But to your question, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a huge part of the sample, um, but it was interesting to see the differences um, in their responses. Perfect. Thank you both so much. That is all the time that we have for today, folks. John Maricelli, very insightful. We appreciate your time today. And um, yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, thank you to everybody for attending today's webinar. As always, we are ready to assist you with your commuter and business needs. Our office remains open during this pandemic, so feel free to call us or leave a voicemail or email with any questions or need assistance. Follow us on Facebook and LinkedIn, and um, we hope to, to see you guys soon. Thank you. Take care.